three of, of track three. Appreciate you being here. Um, Andy Nelson's here. He's this uh, senior engineering manager at Cerner, and I've seen a theme. He's the third speaker and the third person that either is at Cerner or was at Cerner. Just for, just for my own edification, how many people have or are working for Cerner in this room? We're a good company. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, his, his, his job there is, is, I think, probably one of the most difficult jobs. He is guiding software engineers on security best practices. Now, if you've ever done that before, that's a challenge. So, on so, HIPAA stuff. Yeah, on HIPAA stuff, you can do good exactly. So, I mean, with, with that, Andy, I'll turn it over to you. I'll take more time. Cool. No, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to start off by thanking all our sponsors. Uh, if you are interested in working for Cerner, you know where we are. We are in the hiring booth today, so we are hiring kind of all kinds of positions. So come by and talk to us. Talk to everybody else too. There's some free stuff going around everywhere. So, um, like you said, if that will work, there we go. Uh, my talk today, I'm going to talk to you briefly about uh, buzzing for security vulnerabilities. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that sounds great. Uh, I'm always shocked when people follow me on Twitter or like re like my things or post or whatever. It's great. Um, why is it? Oh, I got to turn it on. That's what it's not working. <laughs> all right, call the support. There we go. All right. So who am I? Uh, real quick. So just about me. Uh, I've been a Cerner engineer for uh, almost uh, 11 years now. I've been there since 2008. But really, the last two years have been focused on security. Uh, so when I talk to you guys, most of you guys are way smarter than I am to be talking about these things. So sometimes I'm like, am I really the right guy to talk about this? But uh, you do enough research, and you kind of become the right guy to talk about things. So. And most of my experience is with Java, Ruby on Rails. I've done a bunch of um, Hadoop in the past as well, uh, React recently, and just various other technology sites. So I come with a big developer background, which is why um, this talk may be a little bit different because it's not really um, a security pen tester normalized talk. So, uh, so quick outline, just so you can kind of see what we're going to talk about. I'll give you a brief overline of what fuzzing is, why we do it, um, what kind of things are we going to find, uh, how do we do it, and then uh, we'll just have like a, a you know next step takeaways afterwards. Um, and then if you guys have some time, uh, or if we have time for the end for questions, go ahead and ask questions. So, so let's start off with what, what is fuzzing? So quick overview, it really came out of a software developer uh, met, uh, testing methodology uh, a long time ago, actually, which was shocking to me because most of the time when I start researching security things, it has nothing to do with coming from soft, the software world. And it's really designed around being purely automated. You don't want to be hands-on keyboard, which most of the time when we think about testing and doing things like that, in the software engineering uh, world, it's, it's pretty purely automated, and so that holds true there. We're really just going to provide a bunch of invalid inputs to an application, trying to get unexpected outputs or error states or something of that nature. Um, things that we want to go and exploit and take advantage of in the end. And really, as a developer, I liken this to unit testing on steroids. So this is Stephen Colbert. He's got some steroids. He's shooting them around. Um, but if you're familiar with unit testing, that's really what I, 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 uh, I liken it to. So quickly, I talked about, you know, it came out of software developing. Um, it actually dates back to punch cards. People were doing this with punch cards in the 50s. I found um, some examples of that. I was kind of surprised. I'm, you know, those guys back in the 50s were way smarter than we even credit for. Like, they were using little, anybody have, did anybody ever work on punch cards in here? Yeah, like, you guys are really the smart guys in this room, okay? We're old. Yeah. <laughs> but like, we have computers. Like, we had a real computer. You guys just had these little things, right? And so, uh, I'm getting it right. We had a lot of hanging chests. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of hanging chests. Um, upon reading, I read about a guy named Steve Caps, who actually, they, they think, may have written one of the first programmatic ones in Matt Paint called The Monkey back in 1983. And he was just trying to make uh, images look different and try to make Matt Paint do something different than it was uh, and create unexpected behavior. But really, the term fuzzing came from University of Wisconsin. A, a kid in a course created this thing in, uh, in the 80s, and they kind of came up with this term of fuzzing. And then it kind of took off for some software testing. But then recently, it's really taken this big, giant threshold in, in pen testing and system uh, security testing. So, oh, that went really fast. Why did that do that? I don't know. I'll figure that out tomorrow. Uh, so the life cycle over pen testing. Uh, or sorry, for fuzzing, is really similar to almost everything else we do from a uh, testing perspective. We're going to identify some targets, so maybe some code, may just be straight up uh, you know, C or C++ or Java or, or whatnot. It may just be a website. It may be an operating system. It can be anything. Fuzzing works for everything. It's great. Uh, we're going to generate some fuzz data, whether you make that automatic uh, using a tool, whether you do it yourself. There's word lists out there that you use for fuzz data. There's all uh, kinds of ways to get this data. And then you want to execute your fuzzer. Um, this is where the automated stuff takes over, and you just kind of wait, and then it'll come back with some results later. You look at the results, you monitor them, you find some data in it, and then you go and exploit whatever those things that come back. Um, 
you sometimes you're going to have hits and sometimes you're going to have misses. Uh, this is true of unit testing for engineering in my real space. It's true of pen testers I talk to. Sometimes you, you know, you start working on something, you get nothing out of it. It's sad, but it happens. Uh, in a bunch of my research, there's really just two big generic uh, types of fuzzers, mutation and gen uh, generation-based. But really, mutation-based is, is what I see as the one that most people are using. Uh, these are considered dumb fuzzers. You're just giving them lists, and they're doing bit flips and bit uh, changing and adding on. So if you have the word fuzz, maybe you're changing out the U for an asterisk. If you have the word fuzz, maybe you're adding Zs to the end of it. Um, really, it could be anything. I found a bunch in doing all the research around this, because I hadn't done any stuff before, there is uh, these huge image libraries where people dedicate for images to do fuzzing with. And I'm looking at these, like, what are they doing? It's like emoticon libraries, all these things that they're passing into things like um, you know, paint for your Windows device or a JPEG viewer and things like that to test there that somebody's not injecting something into an image to try and fuzz an image. Uh, so when somebody in your email uh, sends you an email, say, hey, look at this picture of your grandkids. It's not really your grandkids. It's actually an exploit that they're trying to take advantage of you on. Um, and most fuzzers seem to act this way, based on everything I've seen. Is they're just shifting uh, something around and trying to find where there's uh, something they can take a, uh, an exploit. There's uh, this, gen uh, this generation base, and I only found one of these, and these are really, really a lot smarter uh, kind of uh, fuzzers. And the idea behind these is you generate your inputs based on a data model or the data set that you're working with. So it knows, uh, based on some instrumentation of your data model, that it's a website and it's got these status codes and it's got uh, this kind of response and this kind of request headers that are coming through. And I really, I don't, does anybody ever use Peach Fuzzer? Anybody ever use this? Well, we got one. Um, you like it? No? It's expensive, I think. Yeah, and they're all kind of a big pain in the butt. Yeah, so. <laughs> None of them are uh, magic things. Yeah, so. I, I didn't use it because it cost money to use it and I think they maybe had a community edition, but it's, I, I kind of was the same way. I looked at it and like, this kind of looks like a pain to set up and run. And the, the dumb fuzzers were really easy to use, so I didn't really want to go down this route. But more power to you if you want to go that route. All right, so, uh, so why do we want to fuzz? As a software engineer, which again is kind of my job, we're already doing this stuff today. So we're really just taking what we're doing today and leveling up our skill set. We're doing something more to make sure that we're finding stuff that's bad in our applications, in our, in our uh, you know, websites, and things like that. And it's really this um, coming back from you know, I'm going to test zero, and I'm going to test one, and I'm going to test five. Oh, they all passed, hooray. It's well-defined inputs aren't going to give you uh, the right things you're looking for when you're doing software testing. You need to test negative five million and positive 10 million and just varying uh, levels of different uh, things. And then you're going to want to find bugs you can fix. So this is where you can go find them. This is an XKCD from years and years ago where you're waiting on your code to compile. It'd be awesome if we got to the point where we're waiting on our code to fuzz. And uh, this isn't happening in engineering today, but if we start adding these things to our continuous delivery pipelines and integration pipelines, we can get to this point, which is cool. As a researcher, you want to find every way you can do to attack something or find more abilities of something. And so it's really just adding more tools to the toolbox and, and more things for you to exploit and, and go and attack with. So let's, uh, Let's look at, you know, take our hands off the keyboard and let's let some things run because we are going to find vulnerabilities in these things. And, and that's the best part about them. It's going to find stuff. The idea here is you're going to let them run as long as they take and there's going to be something you're going to find out of it. Uh, I found in some of the, the tools we're finding, people had, you know, had these long running applications that have been around forever and they apply a fuzzer to them and they can find stuff and I'll talk about this in a little bit in a matter of days. I mean, it takes a long time to find it, but you will find vulnerabilities doing this. All right, so, so what kind of stuff are we going to find? Because that's, you know, what we're kind of interested in. And really what we're going to find is very significant things. So an integer overflow in Java, for example. So it's okay if you're not familiar with Java. This is a relatively trivial example. All we're doing is taking an input and we're adding it to the max integer. So max integer in Java is like 2 billion, 147 million and change. And we're just going to add whatever that number is to it. And then we're going to print out the two results of those. And you're going to see real quickly, in doing so, if I run this from the, the console, uh, I'm just running it with a, a Java a command and I execute this. If I execute with the, the number zero, it adds zero and we just get back the same result. Now if I do this again, I'm going to get an overflow if I give it one or any other value greater than one. And what is interesting about this is we're going to see a different result, an unexpected result. In this case, it gives us negative two billion blah 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 blah. It loops back around. So in Java, you don't get the, you know, the positive version of this. You go back to negative, 
which that's unexpected for something you can go try and take advantage of. We can do more of these, you know. Um, I recorded this one, but it's really, you know, pass it five, negative 10, varying uh, things, and you get, the, or negative five and 10, and you, get, you can see how it loops, uh, or sorry, negative, yeah, negative five, and then it, it subtracts, and then it adds some more, but you can see how we can test varying scenarios uh, effectively buzzing it. If you want to do a buffer over a flow in C, this is a really common one that we've seen historically. It's not so much anymore as people have moved past, I'm sorry, I, I say that it's still happening, but people are moving into better me memory managed applications and things like that where this isn't as big a concern. But what we're doing here is I'm taking a 100 character, uh, I can uh, take in a, a, a character uh, of 100 characters or, or less, and then I'm trying to copy that into a buffer that I've only slotted at a length of five. And in this case, if, if we copy it out, it'll print out the word copied, and if it doesn't, then it'll print out, uh, or, it'll print out copied and it'll say success. And so if we run this, uh, with a safe value, so I think I need to use the word safe uh, as my input, and I just run it over from the, it says copy it over just fine. Now if I move over, and, oh, sorry, and if I move over and I run it with an unsafe buffer, I think I use the word unsafe, hopefully. I, I uh, like to think that, there you go. Oh no, what did I do? What did I think? Okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, so if you run it with the word unsafe, it's going to give us an abort because it actually failed, and this is unexpected behavior, unexpected input, and this is kind of the things we're looking for to go test with buzzing. And so you could pass it your unit test cases or your test cases that are all you know the cases you expect it to work, but we're really trying to test the things that we don't expect to work. Uh, you can test invalid string formats, so websites that don't sanitize their input. Uh, funny enough, and I didn't realize this at the time, but I gave a talk last year here, or well, at a different location, but as he said, on injection attacks. I didn't realize what I was doing at the time was really a version of fuzzing and trying to attack sites with fuzzing. So if you're interested in seeing that talk, you can go see that talk. So I'm giving myself some, um, you know, whatever you want to use. I don't know the word for that. So I didn't think of the word right. Uh, anyways, so in this case, um, this is just a Rails uh, application. In this Rails application, we have this SQL statement here. In this SQL statement, <laughs> It uh, doesn't sanitize the input. It just takes blindly in whatever the uh, user passes as an ID and just passes it right to SQL directly. And then um, calling this website or calling this URL out from uh, Postman, we can get back and we can pass it one plus or one equals one. So everything always values to true. And then we get back the full gamut of data from the database. And so what's interesting about this again is this is just a fuzzing technique, but I didn't realize at the time that I was doing that. So. So let's look, you know, we briefly talked about some examples, things you're going to find, um, both on, you know, application testing and, you know, pen testing. So how do we do this? And really it comes down to picking a tool. Um, now, as I got more into this, there's really no one tool for the job on this thing. But what I did find was there's highly recommended tools, and one of those seems to be American Fuzzy Lop. I don't know, has anybody used that before? Yeah, a couple of people? It seems to be one of the high, more highly recommended tools. It's pretty powerful. I also found a tool called WFuzz. I don't know if anybody's used WFuzz before. Yeah, yeah, yeah hooray, I picked some good tools. Um, but it's really around testing uh, application uh, websites, APIs, and things of that nature. But there are just so many of these. There's extensions for other ones. You write your own, kind of go from there. So let's look at American Fuzzy Lopper. I don't actually know what the LOP or LOP stands for, so you know, maybe you guys know. But it's a rabbit. It's a rabbit? Is that what you said? Oh, okay, cool. I, I looked briefly and I couldn't find a result and I was like, ah, it's not worth the time. I got other things to work on. Um, it's probably one of the most popular based on what I found. Uh, it's instrumentation based. So this one, you can actually instrument your code. So if you're doing C code or C++ or um, whatever, you actually can compile the code with uh, AFL's fuzzing uh, compiler and uh, you'll compile it with instrumentation. So it knows kind of what to do and it, then the, the tests it generates are based on your test case directory. So if we run this thing, uh, we are gonna, I'll show you quickly how to compile your code. It's just a different command, rather than you know CC or CLang or GCC or whatever. You just use AFL CLang or Clang, however you guys wanna say that. Uh, everybody says it's different. Um, and then I just, I use my overflow library, my C library I wrote, and I just, I'm writing out the overflow, just like you call it any other way, just using a different uh, 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 library to do it. Then uh, we need to create our test directory. You can go pull these down from the, our, our test suite, our corpus is what it's called actually, um, of, of our words we're gonna attack with. And so I'm gonna create one, and this is just, I'm gonna make a, a, directory, uh, a, a dictionary directory and put some words in it. And uh, you can go pull these from the internet. There's thousands of them out there. You can use, you know, built into uh, Kali Linux or Metasploit, they have word lists in there as well. 
I, I, like I said, for the sake of this, I, I use my own. All right, generate my own. I will show you later, I did use a list that I pulled down from SecList, it was a GitHub project I found. But the idea here is, then I, I create my word list, it's got uh, you know four or five words in it, they're all safe words, and it's gonna mutate things at this point. So if I run AFL fuzz uh, with my dictionary, and I'm just gonna uh, run uh, my overflow program, and it's gonna take every line of input into my uh, from my dictionary and run it against here, you're gonna see it prints out a bunch of stuff, and I, that's always too quick to see. But it's running now, and you can see it prints out the total crashes based on everything it's uh, tested so far. It's gonna um, tell you uh, the different kinds of strategies it yields. And so, like in this case, it's doing byte flips and bit flips, and um, then it goes into this habit one. Habit takes forever because it's testing a lot of things, and you'll see what the results of some of these are here in a second when I get to that slide. But and then it really never gets done. It will go for almost indefinitely. Um, and so I, you have to kill it yourself. Is I, I was never. Doing, I let one of these run for like two days and it just kept going. So, uh, yeah, you just you kill it yourself and then you go look at the results. So we go look at the results and it prints out to the output directory. It's got all your crashes and you can see what it did. It changed my Go word to random strings or random characters. It replaced things. I mean, some of these get really crazy. Uh, down here. But I said like it running havoc. Like it did a bunch of stuff I'm never gonna be able to do as a unit tester or a pen tester, but this tool just kind of runs through it and just crushes your application. Um, so out of the box, it's got uh, a couple supported languages with C, C++, Objective C, but I found lots of derivatives of it that are effectively the same thing for almost every language I care about and it's certain that we care, we care about. And then, I mean, just in general, most company, or most places writing code will be able to find one of these. Um, Interestingly enough, somebody went and tested Heartbleed as a validator with uh, 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 American Fuzzy Lock, and they were able to, you know, uh, uh, print out 487 crashes within a day and a half. And so, uh, if somebody had just done the due diligence of testing some of this stuff ahead of time for a day and a half, like we wouldn't have Heartbleed. How much awesome would that have been for everyone else? So, and this is their output from you know, just testing it. Um, so WFuzz is another library I talked about briefly. Um, this is a web fuzzer, so you go and run against websites and you test things. Uh, use a dictionary attack to replace URLs. Uh, so it's really simple to use, and it's really configurable too, which I really uh, like about tools because not everybody is the same. You have snowflakes in the herd and stuff. Uh, so an example of this, I just set up a rail server I'm running on port 3001, and it just posts a route, a single route called login. And what I did with this is all I was doing for the fuzzing on this one was I was just trying to pass it a dictionary. And you can do this with lots of tools. So I'm just, this is a small example. Uh, most people will recommend, you know, uh, I actually found out Verb Suite. I don't use Verb Suite regularly because it's not something I do at work. Um, that you can do this really quickly in Verb Suite yesterday. And uh, uh, so I was just trying to look for anything that I might care about from my path. And so just passing in that dictionary that you saw on the left, or sorry, on the right, it's gonna, with WFuzz against my application, it's gonna churn through, um, oh, sorry, this is, that's what I was telling you, I used Seclus, it was a site on uh, GitHub, that had a bunch, of, um, a bunch of fuzzing dictionaries, and so I'm just navigating to them. Uh, I should speed this up for the next time I present it. Um, anyways, and then I'm gonna tell it, I wanna only return status codes of 200, and then I'm gonna hit local host is where I'm running the Rails server, and, uh, and then I replace the path that I want it to actually fuzz with the word fuzz. So you can actually make this dynamic to where it's, uh, or sorry, um, down to uh, more than one path so you can actually have a nested tree hierarchy uh, of things it's gonna test with. And it's gonna constantly be printing out all the response codes it's hitting for all the different domains, or uh, all the paths it's hitting. So you can see I'm getting 404s because it's not finding anything. Eventually we're gonna get to a login and it's gonna start spinning out 200s. You see, we've got a whole bunch of 200s. And I found out something interesting with Rails it actually will resolve all these other domains that aren't specific, but they shouldn't. So I actually need to go learn some more out of this is what I found out, is I wouldn't expect Rails to return login.php3 as a 200. I didn't know that uh, until I ran this tool. And so this is things that you go and learn and you test, and so like now I know, go and try and figure out how to protect all my other paths so they're not bleeding data out into the, into the world. All right, so that's some quick examples. Sorry it's, it's so quick, it's 20 minutes, so I don't have time to show you guys everything. But the, what you need to do is, is, is your takeaway. So what's next for you guys? What do you want to take away from this? And I can't really give you a prescribed path because everybody here does something a little different. We, I'm an engineer, I do something different than what pen are gonna do. But what I can't tell you is, is as a developer, go introduce it in your testing. So find a way to introduce this as part of your testing ecosystem or your CI pipeline. As a security researcher, 
use it to find vulnerabilities because uh, you saw you can just kind of set this thing aside, let it run. I think they have versions of these things that run on Raspberry Pi, even. So you can just set it up on a Pi that you know costs 20 bucks, and you just have this little machine. I, I hear researchers doing this on Pi all the time, and I'm like, man, those things are more powerful. When the Pi 4 comes out, everybody's in big trouble. <laughs> but it's all around finding the right tool for the job. Uh, and this is true of everything we do. You gotta find the right tools. So go, go find the right tool. Or, like I said, there's derivatives of a lot of these tools. You can go create your own, expand from it, and create your own, and then contribute it back so that you can use it. Or keep it yourself, and then just be the one guy that's really good at it. Um, there's a couple enterprise tools, and I actually reached out to these guys. Um, BuzzBuzz is a, a buzzing as a service application. They uh, support a, a handful of languages out of the box right now. I think C, C++. They're effectively running um, what it looked like to me, AFL under the covers, but it may be something else. Um, they're brand new to this, uh, from what I can tell. They're, I actually emailed them last week because I saw them in a headline on, tech, uh, on TechCrunch. They just got a $2 million um, seed round of uh, money from a bunch of investors. I asked them some questions, and they're going to support pretty much every other language and web testing. And I ran through some of their demo stuff, and it's pretty slick. Like, you just upload that, and a YAML file configured with some of the data you care about, and it was really cool. So I, uh, I'd highly recommend going and checking that out. Or if you don't want to pay for something or use something external like that, um, Cluster Fuzz is by Google. They actually have an open source um, fuzzing t uh, technology in a distributed fashion. And this is really cool because you can um, set this up in an organization, and you could actually like start testing and fuzzing things uh, kind of uh, at a big, big, big scale across all of your applications, depending how big your company is. We're really big, so we have lots of artifacts on the test now. So. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, that's all I have. If you like my talk, you can leave me feedback. If you didn't, just walk out quietly. Um, <laughs> if you have other comments around the, the conference or anything else, there's feedback to be left at all in all the talks. Uh, if you guys want to talk more about um, buzzing or things like that, I will be around. You can come chat with me. Um, I'll be at the CERN booth here, I think like 12.30 to 1-ish, right around lunchtime for a little while. So you can chat with me there. Um, thank you guys for coming. Uh, I, if it's not a